The best way to generate passive income is not by doing online surveys or by trading stocks. For one, they're not even passive. And number two, you're probably going to lose money or get a virus on your computer. Instead of doing one of these gimmicky things to generate cash flow, do this instead. Here's the thing. If you want to generate cash flow that's passive, the way that you do that is by accumulating assets that pay you for owning them passively. Now, here's the thing that most people do not want to accept, but you have to understand this. If you really want to generate this type of passive cash flow, you need more money. The more money you have, the more cash flow that you're going to be able to get. You're not going to get rich because of this passive income that you're buying. You have to have the money first and then use the money to buy this cash flow. Now, that being said, you don't need millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars or even thousands of dollars to get started. It doesn't hurt to get started even if you have $10 to start investing, but what you have to understand and be real with yourself about is the type of returns that you're going to be getting. The goal with this type of cash flow is to take the money that you have, put it to work, and then start generating an income. That's what we're going to be talking about today, and there are seven main assets that I'm going to be talking about in this video that you can work to accumulate that will start paying you with cash flow if you do it the right way. Number one is by buying and investing in physical real estate. Number two is crowdfunded real estate. Number three is domestic dividend ETFs. Number four is international dividend ETFs. Number five is high-yield savings accounts. Number six is businesses, and number seven is royalties. So I'm going to start with number one, which is my personal favorite, investing in physical real estate. Now, the name of the game for generating cash flow from real estate has completely changed because of the mortgage market and how the mortgage market has changed. Over the last few years, we experienced the lowest mortgage rates ever, which made it a lot easier for people to generate cash flow from real estate because the general rule of thumb for generating cash flow from real estate is if the interest rate that you're paying on your mortgage is lower than the return you're getting on the property, you have the ability to generate a profit. And the flip is also true. If the return on your property is lower than the mortgage, then it's going to be harder for you to generate a return on your property. So if you take a look at the mortgage rates over the last decade, decade and a half, what you'll see is that mortgage rates have really skyrocketed after the lows that we saw after the 2020 pandemic. Now, what does that mean? We have seen mortgage rates skyrocket, while at the same time, home prices and commercial real estate prices have also gone up. So now, today, it is very difficult to find good cash flow producing real estate deals because the cost of borrowing money has gone up so much, while also the prices of real estate have also gone up, which means two things. We could, number one, see more of a correction in real estate prices because in order for someone to justify investing in real estate, you need better returns. And number two, for people that have cash, it creates more buying opportunities because it's very difficult to justify investing in real estate with high amounts of debt, especially in the market that we're seeing today. So now, how does real estate investing work? Well, it really depends on where you live because real estate investing in the Midwest is very different than real estate investing in California and Arizona and Texas. And I can tell you this because I have worked with many different investors in many different parts of the country and I grew up investing in real estate in the Midwest. Now, when I say I grew up investing in real estate, I don't mean I started investing in real estate when I was four years old. I mean, I started investing in real estate in the Midwest. That's where I learned about investing in real estate because my office is in the Metro Detroit area. The way that I invest in real estate is I invest in real estate for one purpose and one purpose only, cash flow. And so what I'm looking for is when I go out and buy a property, how much money do I have to invest today and how much cash is this property going to pay me year after year after year from here on out? And the reason why I do this as opposed to buying a property today and wondering how much I can sell it for in five years is because it is much more difficult to guess how much a property is going to be worth in five years. That's speculation. And maybe you'll hit your goals. Maybe you'll exceed your goals. Or maybe the economy will take a turn for the worst. And I don't like to play those types of games. I want that consistency and cash flow. When you're predicting how much rent you can generate, it's much easier and much more certainty. You can guess how much money you're going to be making year after year after year. That's why I invest for cash flow. Now, in the commercial real estate game, there's something called the cap rate. 
Cap rate is the cash on cash return on your money. Meaning, if I went out and I bought a $100,000 property that had a 10 cap, a 10% cap rate, that means that if I bought this $100,000 property with cash, I would generate $10,000 worth of profit this year after paying off the expenses. So this $100,000 property is gonna generate some money, say it generates $20,000 worth of revenue, you have $10,000 worth of expenses, that $10,000 worth of profit divided by the price that you have to pay, the $100,000, equals the 10% return, the 10% cap rate. Now, what we're seeing today is that cap rates are still low while mortgage rates keep going up, meaning the returns on properties are still kinda low while the interest rate you have to pay on debt is going up here, which makes it much more difficult to find a good deal. Again, this could be an indication for corrections in property prices in the future. But let's talk about what you should be paying attention to because what I've been seeing over the last few years is when you go to some of these other hot markets like real estate in Texas or Arizona, over the last few years, I've been seeing things like one cap properties, sometimes even zero or negative cap properties. Meaning if we stick with that $100,000 property example, you buy this $100,000 property, if there's a 1% cap rate, that means you're gonna make $1,000 in profit from this property after owning it for a year, assuming you have no debt on the property. Now you might be thinking, why in the world would anybody wanna buy that? Because if you have any debt, you're gonna be losing money. And even if you don't have debt, if things don't go perfectly, you're gonna be losing money. Well, it goes back to your goal as a real estate investor because many times now when people are buying these types of deals they don't really care about the cash flow what they're thinking is i'll buy this property for a hundred thousand dollars maybe i'll make a little bit of money each year maybe i have to pay a little bit of money every year it doesn't matter because in five years i'm going to be able to sell this property for two hundred thousand dollars and walk away with a big profit check so who cares about the cash flow that's not the game that i play I'm looking for cash flow. When I look for real estate deals, I'm generally looking for a 7% cash on cash return on my money. Meaning, if I'm gonna go out and buy this $100,000 property, if I'm buying it all cash, I want to see $7,000 worth of profit after paying my expenses, hitting my bank account this year because I bought this property, or at least after this property is fully renovated and rented or out. Because sometimes you're gonna buy a property that's completely distressed and it's gonna take three to four months to turn it around. Now, when you go out and you're looking for good real estate deals, there are three different things that you want to pay attention to. Number one is the type of property that you're buying. Number two is where you're buying this property. And number three is the condition of the property of itself, because this is what's going to help determine what types of returns you're going to get on your property. Number one is the type of property that you're buying. In today's economy that we're experiencing right now, if you wanted to go out and buy, say, an apartment complex, well, you are playing in a game where there's not a lot of inventory of apartment complexes for sale and everybody wants to buy apartment complexes because there's such a low inventory of housing. And so people want to rent homes, people want to buy homes, there's not that much housing available. So naturally, you are playing a game where now everybody wants to buy these types of housing. People want to buy single family homes, people want to buy apartment complexes. So you're going to have to be willing to pay a premium, which means the returns that you get are going to be a little bit lower because well, everybody wants apartment complexes. Compare that to something like offices in big cities. If you look at a lot of offices in big cities, many of them are sitting half vacant. And so now when you're looking to buy, say, an apartment comp or an office building, now you have much less competition because, well, not many people want to buy offices because they're worried about the future of the office market. And because of that, you have less interest from other buyers. So you have more negotiating room as a buyer to buy an office building. So you have higher potential returns. Now, again, in order for you to generate those higher returns, you're going to have to fill up the property. There's higher risk, but this is where you have more leverage as a buyer to be able to negotiate more. Now, does this mean that you're going to necessarily be able to fill up that office building? Maybe, maybe not. But this is where you have to understand the psychology as an investor of how the economy plays a part in the prices of certain types of real estate and how it's not always equal. The residential market, the apartment market is very different than the office market today. The second thing you wanna pay attention to is where you are buying. Because an apartment complex in New York City versus a home in rural Idaho in the cornfields are gonna have two completely different prices. You've probably heard of people talking about how a 4,000 square foot home in the Midwest that sells for $300,000 would sell for $13 million in Beverly Hills. 
Why? It's because of the location. Now, when people want to buy a certain property as an investment, that location is going to play a part to your risk. The higher the risk, the higher potential return that you're going to need, which means if you're buying a property in the cornfields in Idaho, you're going to expect a higher return than buying a property in primetime Manhattan, which means if you're buying a property in primetime Manhattan, expect a lower rate of return than a property in the cornfields of Idaho, because in the cornfields of Idaho, you're going to have less demand to buy the property, higher potential vacancy, a tougher time finding a good tenant versus in Manhattan. If you don't like the first 10 applicants that you get for that property, just leave it open for another day and you'll get another 15 applicants of people who want to rent that property. You're going to have a lot lower vacancy in Manhattan. You have a lot more bigger tenant pool selection. So you have lower risk in Manhattan, higher risk in the cornfields of Idaho, which generates now a different type of return. And that's where if you're looking for a certain type of return, you got to understand where you're also looking for deals. The third thing you have to pay attention to is the actual health of the property that you're looking to buy. Because if you're buying a turnkey property, a property that you walk into, it looks brand new and renovated, brand new, fresh flooring, freshly painted walls, new fixtures. Maybe you already have a tenant or tenants there that are paying your rent. This property is ready to go. It looks nice. It smells nice. Well, you're going to pay a premium for this turnkey property because it's ready to go. Maybe it's already generating cash flow. You're going to pay a premium for that, meaning a lower return for you. Compare that to walking into a property and as soon as you open the door, it smells like crap. You open the door a little bit more, you see that there's holes in the walls. You open the door a little bit more, you see a raccoon running in the kitchen. You open the door a little bit more and you don't even know if there's a floor in the living room. That is going to generate you the potential to earn a higher return because you're going to pay a much more discount to buy this property. Because now if you're going to buy this type of distressed property, well, you're going to want higher potential returns because you're taking on more risk. You're taking on more work. And so you're going to need higher types of returns to justify that type of risk. This is where now you got to figure out, one, what types of property you want to be investing in. Number two, where you're looking to invest your money. And then number three, how much work do you really want to take on and what types of properties that you want? Now, I don't recommend what I do to anybody, but I'll tell you what I do because I'm generally looking for that 7% cash on cash return. And the way that I look for these types of properties is number one, I find the areas which are booming, where people want to live, where people want to live, work, and play, those types of areas. And then I look at the areas just outside of that where people feel like uh, I'm priced out of this booming area. So let me go to this next neighborhood right next to it, because this is where I'm looking for those growth opportunities where you have more of the up and coming areas. Property prices are lower. The rents are generally not that much lower because, well, you're not that far out from the area that everybody wants to be. And this is where I'm looking for those growth opportunities. And the way that you can find these types of opportunities is number one, just go do the coffee shop test. Go to that neighborhood that's right next to where everybody wants to be and find where the coffee shops are opening up. Then when you see those coffee shops opening up, go to a few different coffee shops and ask the barista, the person that's making you the coffee, a few questions. Number one, do you live in this neighborhood? If yes, do you like it? If no, why don't you live here? What you want to see is, do they want to live here or do they live here and do they enjoy living here? If people want to live there and they enjoy living there, that's a good sign. If people don't want to live there or they don't enjoy living there, that's a bad sign. So talk to multiple people and just get the general feel and then walk around the neighborhood, walk around the area, see what the buzz is. Are you seeing more signs of restaurants opening nightlife opening, businesses opening, new developments happening, or are you seeing the opposite? Businesses shutting down and abandoned buildings and buildings being boarded up. Figure out which one you're seeing because if you're seeing the businesses start to come, you're seeing the opening soon signs and you're seeing the coffee shops open because coffee shops are one of the first types of businesses that open in new up and coming areas. That's a great sign for you. Now, of course, it's a risk because... Now you're betting that this area is going to grow and that's a risk because there's a chance that it doesn't grow. There's a chance that the economy takes a turn for the worse. There's a chance that you're going into the wrong areas, but the higher risk comes with higher potential return. And that's where you want to now make sure you do your research to find areas that people are wanting to be where businesses are moving to. So that's the types of properties that I personally look for. And I also like distressed properties because, well, 
I am fortunate to have a good team of contractors, of people that can help me now turn a property around. I kind of find it fun to find these distressed properties and turn them around and kind of help rebuild that area. So I like those types of deals. Plus, it helps get the better returns as well because when most people walk into these types of distressed properties, they walk in and they walk right out because it smells like crap and it looks like crap and that's where I see the opportunity because nobody else wants those deals, which also gives me more negotiating room because, well, there's way less buyers bidding for that type of property. Now, before I jump into number two, this is where now it also is very helpful for you to stay up to date on what's happening in the housing market because it'll help you understand what direction the housing market is moving, what direction the real estate market is moving, especially based on what's happening with interest rates. And an easy way to do that is by joining something like Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter. I created Market Briefs as a free resource to help you stay up to date on what's happening in things like the housing market, the stock market, the general economy, the global economy, and crypto currency. It's completely free and you can read the newsletter in less than five minutes every morning. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I got the link to how you can join down in the description below. The second way that you can generate cash flow from real estate without having to go out and actually buy a property, without having to manage a property, without having to deal all of that is by doing crowdfunded real estate, which was originally known as syndicate real estate. Now, let me back up a little bit and explain the passiveness of investing in real estate. See, real estate is only kind of passive if you have the right team to make it passive for you. When I started investing in real estate, I had no idea how real estate investing worked. I hired a property manager, I found a contractor, but the contractor ended up scamming me and stealing my money and running away. My property manager ended up being a horrible property management company that I don't even think was licensed. So I dealt with a lot of issues and it was anything but passive. And I was also losing money. But then once I figured it out, it became much more passive for me. Now today, when I manage my real estate portfolio, I'm not going door to door to each property. I have a management company that does that for me. I'm meeting a management company regularly. My managers, I'm learning about what's happening in the units. I'm reading my monthly reports and I'm reading my quarterly reports. So yeah, it's more passive, but it's not completely passive because I still need to be involved to make sure that my team is doing the right thing. And this is where I have a lot of interesting debates with real estate investors about managing properties or not, because you don't need a property management company. A decent property management company is going to charge somewhere between 4% to 12% of your gross rental income. The amount of money you pay is going to depend on number one, how much work that they're doing. And number two, how many units you're giving to the property management company. So they're going to take a piece of your rent right off of the top. And this is where you have some real estate investors that really get irritated by the idea of why would I want to pay somebody else to do something that I can do myself? And well, this is where the question is, it's not a matter of you being able to do it yourself. The question is really, do you want to, to do it yourself? Do you want to allocate your time to that? Do you want to allocate that brain power to that? Do you want to have to have that stress where if your tenant clogs the toilet because of what they ate last night, do you want to get the phone call or do you want to have your property manager company deal with it who has their contractors on speed dial deal with it? That way you don't have to worry about it and you just get a report about it at the end of the month or maybe next month. And that's where for me, I want to spend my time as an investor and not have to deal with the tenant issues and not have to deal with all the little day-to-day -day stuff like paying the bills, making sure that the rent gets paid, making sure that the property taxes get paid, making sure that all the other expenses are taken care of and documented. I don't want to deal with that. So yeah, it is worth my time to pay somebody else to manage it. That way I can spend my time doing something else and I can just review the reports. And this is where if your goal is to be an investor, make it more passive for you by getting a property manager to help you manage your portfolio. That way you don't have to worry about doing it yourself. Yes, it's an additional fee, but it's going to save you time and it's going to save you that brain stress, which really becomes priceless for you. Now, the next way that you can invest in real estate passively is by doing something called crowdfunded or syndicate real estate deals. And this really started, I mean, it's been going on for a long time, but syndicate real estate deals were the traditional way to do crowdfunded real estate deals where essentially you are passively investing in somebody else's real estate deal. So let me give you a hypothetical. Let's say I'm a real estate developer and I want to go out and build or redevelop or purchase this $10 million apartment complex. Now, in order for me to go out and buy this $10 million complex, I might need $3 million as a down payment, and then I'm going to finance $7 million from the bank. Well, if I have the $3 million, I could go out and buy this deal myself. 
but maybe I don't want to use all of my extra cash in the bank, or maybe I don't have $3 million. In that case, I'm going to have to go out and raise this money. This is where now I'm going to look for people like you who want to invest in my deal. And now you can be a passive investor into this $10 million property. And if I can sell this property for $12 million, or if I can do a cash out refinance in 18 months, then I can pay you a return you get exposure to my real estate deal and you don't have to worry about doing any of the work. You can still find these deals today by going to real estate investor conferences. They happen all around the country where you will always see investors and developers looking for money to go out and invest in the next big real estate deal. But now, thanks to the internet, it's also become much more accessible to invest in these types of crowdfunded deals because there are platforms that will allow you to passively invest into funds or portfolios that will give you exposure to real estate. So this is the way now that you're not investing in actual REITs. When you're investing in a REIT, a real estate investment trust, then what you're doing is you're investing into a company which invests in real estate. So you're getting equity in the company that owns real estate. With these types of crowdfunded deals, you're getting exposure to the actual property itself as opposed to the company that's managing the property. Now, there's a lot of different types of crowdfunded platforms on the internet. You can find a platform that's right for you. Just understand, just like with anything else, there's risks because there's, number one, a risk that you can give somebody your money and they can run away. Number two, there's a risk that you can invest your money into this deal and then the economy takes a turn for the worst. Number three, there's a risk that you can invest your money into this deal and the deal just doesn't work out because the investor or the developer was wrong, their projections were wrong, they couldn't get the rents that they wanted, they couldn't get the valuation that they wanted. So there's risks with investing in real estate, whether you're doing it yourself or whether you're investing in somebody else's deal. But the advantage with syndicate or these types of crowdfunded deals is that you get to save the time because now you're passively investing in somebody else's deal. Now, if you're looking for platforms online that will allow you to do this type of crowdfunded real estate, you can find the best one for you. We have a partnership here at Minority Mindset with a company called Fundrise. Fundrise is is an affiliate with Minority Mindset. I'm also an investor in Fundrise and I've also invested my own money with Fundrise. That being said, don't just take my word for it. Go out and see if it's right for you. Uh, if you want to use Fundrise, I have my affiliate link down in the description, which means if you use my link, we will get compensated, but there's no additional cost for you. Again, they offer you the ability to get exposure to real estate from these types of crowdfunded deals. You don't need a ton of money to get started, which is the advantage of these types of crowdfunded deals. It's completely passive, but the still risks are there like we were just talking about, which is why you need to make sure you do your own due diligence before you invest your money into anything because investing has risks and you're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point. So make sure you understand that before you go in. The third way that you can start generating passive cash flow from your investments is by investing your money into dividend ETFs domestically. Our economy is going through a complete investment shift right now because of where interest rates are going. Now, I already talked about this in the real estate market, but you're seeing the exact same thing into the stock market where in 2020 and 2021, when we saw the lowest interest rates ever, people were dumping their money into growth stocks, into these tech stocks, into these high momentum stocks, because when you have these low interest rates, these startups can borrow money for dirt cheap, or they can raise venture capital for dirt cheap. And now you can go out and take boatloads of money and try to grow your business. And that raised a lot of investment dollars because now all these startups were able to get a whole lot of funding for very cheap. And they were able to grow very quickly, which also caused their valuations to skyrocket. That's why you saw this huge boom in growth, momentum, and startup companies in 2020, 2021, and even into 2022. But then in 2022, when interest rates started to rise, you can look at this federal funds chart right here, which shows how the federal funds rates changed when the Federal Reserve Bank started raising interest rates. Well, when the interest rates started to boom, it became much more difficult for these startups and tech companies and growth companies to continue raising that same amount of money, which caused this huge valuation shift, especially in these type of growth startup and tech companies. And then investors no longer to, wanted to 
pour their money into these startup companies and these growth companies, but rather they wanted value companies. A value company is now a company that is established, that's generating a profit, and is maybe even paying a dividend. A dividend is when a company pays you cash for doing nothing except owning it. So if a company has a lot of profit at the end of the year, there's three things that they can do with this profit. Number one is they can use this money to invest back into the company. They can open more stores, open more manufacturing plants, invest it in research and development, and hire more employees. Option number two is they can save this money for an emergency. And option number three is they can give this money away to the shareholders, their investors, people like you, people like me, with a dividend. Now, in order for a company to pay a dividend, they have to, number one, have this profit at the end of the year. And number two, they need no better use for this money. Because if a company has $100 million in their bank account and they're really trying to grow very quickly, they don't want to just give it away to their shareholders because that's going to shoot themselves in the foot because now they're not going to be able to have any money to invest in more stores or invest in more marketing. So when a company is trying to grow, they don't want to use their profit to give it back to the shareholders. They want to take this money and invest it back into the company. So for a company to pay out these dividends, they need, number one, the profit in their bank account. And then number two, they need no better use for this money where now they're making all this profit. And they say, well, we have nothing better to do. Let's just give this money away to our shareholders. That's when companies should pay dividends. And that's when you start to see companies paying dividends. This is where now you start to see value companies. These are what value companies are. And that's where money has been flowing from an investment perspective. Now, what does that mean? Well, number one, obviously the valuations of some of these, these value companies have gone up in the recent years because of the money flow, the shift in money flow, but it also creates opportunities if you know where to look. Now, I'm not going to go into how do you find good stocks, how do you analyze stocks, and how do you do that in this video, but if you don't want to get into the business of investing in companies and doing that research with individual companies, the next best thing is to invest in a fund, something like an ETF that gives you exposure to a basket of companies. A basket of companies is called an index, and now you're investing into this group of dividend-paying stocks. Now, this is where the key and the way that you succeed isn't by investing your money one time, and it's not by perfectly trying to time the market. That's how people lose money. That's how people lose in the stock market. If you want to win as an investor who's trying to generate cash flow from the stock market, now what you want to do is you want to find these ETFs, these dividend-paying ETFs, and just invest your money every week, every two weeks, every month. Every time you get paid, you just keep buying more of these things that are now paying you with cash flow. The advantage of investing into this type of fund is now you have reduced your risk because you might have a fund that invests into 500 companies. And now if one of these companies goes bankrupt, well, it doesn't really affect you that much because it's balanced up by the 499 other winners. So there are funds that are designated specifically to generating cash flow where funds are investing in companies that are paying out strong cash flows. Now, again, if one of these companies cuts their dividends or no longer offers a dividend, it's okay because now this fund will kick that company out and put another company in and it's balanced out by some of the other dividends. That's the advantage of investing into these types of dividend paying ETFs. And for this particular number three, I'm talking about domestic dividend paying ETFs, meaning companies inside of the United States. Now I'm going to give you a few examples. I'm not telling you what to invest in. I'm just giving you some examples. Make sure you do your research yourself. Number one is VYM. Number two is SCHD. Number three is SPYD. Now you can see these tickers on the screen and the current dividend yields that they're offering on the screen at the time of me recording this video. Now, the ones with asterisks as a disclaimer are ETFs that I personally invest in myself. But this is where now the way that it works is you are buying this fund that we now you can generate cash flow and you're doing two things. Number one, you're going to keep buying more shares of this fund. That way, every time you buy more of this fund, you're going to buy more cash flow. Anytime you get paid, you're buying more cash flow. You're just throwing more money into this to buy more cash flow. Every time you throw more money in, you're going to get more cash flow out. And the second thing now, if you really want to win in this game, is when you start getting your dividends, which are generally paid quarterly, meaning every three months, instead of taking the money and using it to fund your lifestyle for now, Use that money to buy more cash flow. So every time you get paid, you're buying more cash flow. And every time you get cash flow, you're using it to buy more cash flow. That way you're just building this machine. You're making money, 
buying cash flow. Your cash flow is making you money. You're buying more cash flow because if you do this for a decade, you're going to surprise yourself at how much cash flow you can create if you stick with it because now you're just working to pad that cash flow. You're buying more little pieces of machines that are going to pay you with more cash flow. Now, again, you want to make sure you do your own research and figure out what types of things you want to invest in because I've been talking about real estate and I mentioned REITs. REITs are real estate investment trusts. A real estate investment trust is now where you are investing into a company that invests in real estate. Now, real estate investment trusts also have some special rules where they are required, these companies, these real estate investment trusts are required to pay out 90% of their taxable income, their, their profitable, their profit to their shareholders through dividends. So REITs generally pay out high dividends. And if you want to look for REIT ETFs, again, if you don't want to have to worry about trying to find the perfect REIT, if you don't want to have to do all the research and all the work, the next best thing is to invest in an ETF or an index fund, a fund that's going to give you exposure to these types of REITs. I'm going to give you a few examples. Again, I'm not telling you what to invest in, just giving you a few examples. Number one is VNQ. Number two is SCHH. Number three is XLRE. You can see the ticker symbols right here and the current dividends that they're offering. You can use these as starting points for your research as to what types of funds that you want to invest in. Again, the way that you win in this game is not just by throwing your money into these funds once. It's not just by hoping that these funds are going to grow and make you a lot of money. It's by consistently passively and automatically investing your money into these funds week after week after week, month after month after month, year after year after year. And if you do that over the course of a number of years or decades, you're going to build a strong brand new stream of passive cash flow, which you can use to now fund your lifestyle. Again, the more money you have to invest, the more cash flow that you're going to get. Now, there are a lot of platforms that can automate this for you. I have some of my affiliate platforms that I use down in the description. If you're looking for an app that can do this type of passive investing for you and automate that entire process. The fourth way that you can generate this type of cash flow is by investing your money into international dividend ETFs. Now, in the number three that I was just talking about, we were talking about domestic dividend ETFs. These are funds in the United States that are companies in the United States that pay out cash flow. Now, the next thing that you can do if you're, let's just say, worried about the United States economy, you want to have some diversification outside of the dollar, you want to have a little bit of protection in your portfolio, you can also consider investing in some international dividend ETFs, which is now you are investing into funds. Remember, ETFs are funds. You're investing in funds that own companies that operate outside of the United States and sometimes without the United States dollar. So this gives you another form of diversification. Uh, you can incorporate some of these into your portfolio if you feel like this diversification would be good for you. Let me give you a few examples of where to start. Number one is VYMI. Number two is IDV. Number three, PXF. Now again, you can see that the returns on some of these international dividends ETFs are a lot higher than what you see domestically because, well, when you're taking on these international companies, you're taking on a little bit higher risk, which also means, well, you want to compensate yourself with a little bit higher returns as well. You'll see a little bit more volatility, sometimes a lot more volatility with these types of ETFs. Never invest in anything solely because of its dividend yield because the dividend yield can be misleading. And if you see really high dividend yields, that can also mean either something's wrong with the companies or that it's, it's an extremely volatile stock or fund. So take that for what it's worth. You can add some of these into your portfolio as well or some other funds that you feel like would be fitting. But this is where you can add some diversification into your portfolio. That way now you're not just investing into companies and funds in the United States, but you also have some international exposure that can protect you against, say, a slowdown here in the United States. And this is where you can diversify your money into different countries as well. The fifth way that you can start generating some cash flow on your money, which you can finally start doing now, is by keeping some of your money into high interest savings accounts. If you have some cash that you're waiting for a good investment opportunity, or let's say you're waiting to buy a home or you're waiting to buy a car, you have some extra cash sitting there, well, you can move your money into a high interest savings account. These are online savings accounts that will pay you higher interest on your savings for doing nothing except saving your money there. Now, you want to make sure that you're banking with banks that are FDIC insured, that are legitimate banks. But the advantage here is you can earn three, if not four, if not close to 5% in interest 
annually on your money. It's not a CD, so your money is not locked up at all. This is a legit savings account. It's FDIC insured. It's a legitimate bank. And now you're earning higher interest because you're just putting your money into these online high interest savings accounts. Now, if you've never used an online bank before, you might feel a little bit worried, a little bit sketched out. That's how I was too. And when the first time I moved my money into an online savings account, this was years ago, I remember I went to my bank and I had to wire the money to my online bank account. And my banker, who was paying me 0.01% at the time, was like, are you sure you want to do this? We can put your money into a CD where we're going to pay you like one and a half percent. And I said, well, this high interest savings account is paying me 2%. This was years ago, back when high interest savings accounts are paying 2% and CDs at banks are paying one and a half percent. And I said, why would I want to tie my money up into the CD, get one and a half percent when I can just move my money into a high interest savings account and get 2%. She didn't believe in it. My bank teller, my banker didn't believe in it, but I moved my money there. And that was when I really started liking these high interest savings accounts for the interest that you're going to get. Now, of course, in today's economy, there's a lot of issues in the banking sector. You've seen banks go under. That probably is not over. So again, do your research, do your due diligence about where you're banking your money and also understand what the FDIC limits are. So if you are married and you have $2 million, instead of putting all $2 million into one bank, maybe create four different high interest savings accounts. That way your money is protected. But again, you also want to make sure that you understand where you are banking because well, some banks are a lot healthier than others. And especially in today's economy, it's important to know where your money is being kept. Do your research. Do not blindly listen to a random guy on YouTube. Find the right places for you because you have to take care of your money. But what I'm trying to say is that you have the opportunity to finally earn some interest on your savings. If you move your money to a high interest savings account, just make sure you're using a legitimate high interest savings account because right now some high interest savings accounts are paying four to five percent in interest a year on your savings. The sixth way that you can start generating some cash flow is by using businesses to your advantage. Now, this one is going to be the most difficult one that I'm going to discuss today. And the way that it works here is either number one, you're going to build a business or number two, you're going to buy a business where you do not have to work. Let me start by talking about number one, where you build a business. If you are an entrepreneur and you can build a legitimate business where now you have a team of people that can operate the company and then you can fire yourself as a CEO and you can hire a new CEO to run the company and you can incentivize them with some revenue share or some profit share. Now you have a company, you own the equity, the asset, you own the business itself and the business is working. Now the workers, the employees in the business are working to generate an employee. Maybe you put them all on some sort of revenue or profit share. That way everyone's motivated to keep driving production and keep making more money. But then the cash that's left over in the bank account after paying the employees, after paying your contracts, after paying your debts, that money, that profit is yours. But this is very difficult to get to because you have to actually build a legitimate business and get it to this point and then find somebody to then take your spot. This is going to take many years to do. But if you are an entrepreneur, you can then one day build it to the point where you can own the business and have somebody else run it for you. It is possible, but it's not easy. The alternative, if you want to do something like this, but you don't want to build a business itself, is you can buy a business where you don't want to have to work in yourself. Now, if you are interested in buying a business, number one, it's going to take money. And number two, if you want to buy a business where you do not have to work, it's going to take even more money. We're talking about multi-million dollar businesses. So if you're looking for easy, accessible things, this is not where you want to start. But as you build your wealth, you can buy businesses, whether it's franchises or non-franchise businesses, and then you can hire a team of people to manage it and run these businesses for you. Again, you're going to need access to capital, and it's not going to be completely passive because you're still going to want to make sure that your managers and your directors are running the business in a way that is continuing to grow and exceed profit expectations. So there's a lot of work required here, but it can be a great way for you to generate cash flow by owning the asset, the business, where you have teams of people that are working to run the company. And the seventh way that you can generate cash flow is by generating royalties. The way that you can generate royalties is you build some sort of intellectual property and then you license it out or you put this 
your intellectual property out there so people can purchase or get access to your intellectual property. Now, what does this mean? Well, the simple example of this is making YouTube videos. When I make these YouTube videos and I put them on the internet, well, this is my intellectual property that now is on YouTube. And when people watch these videos, I get paid. The way that I get paid is through advertisements. You've probably seen that there's advertisements on these videos. Well, I get a piece of those advertisements. I share in that revenue with YouTube. I think we get paid like something like a penny per view. It's not a ton of money, but it's a way to generate royalties. And then once you build it, it's there forever. Right, this video is going to be live today. It's going to be live next year. It's going to be live the year after that. And each year that it's on the internet, it's going to continue generating me pennies if people continue to watch it. If nobody watches it, I don't get paid. Another way to do this would be through writing books. This was the traditional way to get and generate royalties. You write a book, and if you can write a good book that people want to read, well, it's going to end up in bookshelves. People will want to buy them. Schools might want to buy them. Corporations might want to buy them, or industries might want to buy them, and then give them away to their people. Now, again, you spend the time, effort, energy, and money to build this intellectual property, the book, one time. Once you create it, if people continue to buy it, well, you can generate royalties. Now, again, in order for this to work, you have to have good intellectual property. There's a bunch of people that try to make YouTube videos that never get any views. There's a bunch of people that try to write books that never get any sales. So it takes work. It takes a lot of work to see success on this. But if you can put in the work, well, then you can generate royalties for the rest of your life if you put in the work to build the intellectual property in the first place. Now, if you don't want to do it through books or through YouTube, the next way to do that was would be through licensing some sort of technology. If you've ever seen Shark Tank, you've seen Mr. Wonderful talk about how he loves licensing technologies. The whole idea here is if you can create a product that another company needs, this company will then license the use of your technology Put this technology in their products and then pay you a penny or a dollar or whatever the fee might be every time they use your product in all of their products that they are selling. So this takes more work. But again, if you are an inventor, if you are an entrepreneur and you can create something that other businesses need, you can license them the ability to use your product and then you get paid every time another company uses it. The thing that so many people get wrong about passive income or cash flow is they think that is the secret to getting rich. When in reality, cash flow or passive income is the byproduct of being rich in the first place. You have to have money and then you can use this money to buy these assets that pay you with cash flow. The reason why so many people get scammed or screwed over on this whole idea of passive income is because they think that, oh, if I do X, Y, and Z, if I start day trading, if I start doing online surveys, if I start making YouTube videos, it is going to create passive income for me. When in reality, well, guess what? It's going to take a lot of work. And a lot of these things are going to cost you a lot of time. And a lot of these things might even lose you money unless you're willing to dedicate yourself to it. The way that you can generate true cash flow, true passive income, is you got to generate the income first. You got to generate the cash. And then you take this dead cash that's sitting in your bank that's not doing anything. And then you're going to put it to work by buying an asset. You're buying real estate. You're buying dividend paying stocks. You're buying a business. You're buying something that's now active that's working to produce you cash flow. That's the way that passive income works. And most people don't want to say that because, well, everybody's lured to the idea of passive income because, well, who doesn't want to get paid while they're sleeping? Everybody loves that idea. But if you really want to generate that type of passive income that doesn't require your full-time effort, well, you're going to have to put in the work. And it's really funny when you hear people talking about how you can build this online business and it's going to be passive. Listen, I have an online business. It generates income. It generates income when I'm sleeping, but it's not passive. It's my full-time job. Briefs Media is my full-time job. Sure, sometimes we get sales overnight. Sure, sometimes we have sales deals come in overnight when I'm sleeping. But guess what? I run the company every single day. It's a full-time job. And so running a business is not passive income. People love the idea of passive income, which is why you see it thrown around everywhere on the internet. But the true Passive, quote unquote, passive income is owning assets, dividend paying stocks, owning real estate, getting interest from a high interest savings account in your savings account, or owning a passive business. That's what most people would really consider, quote unquote, passive income, but it takes number one, work to get there. And number two, you still got to manage your portfolio. I own a portfolio of real estate, and guess what? I'm still managing 
I'm looking at my monthly reports. I'm looking at my quarterly reports. I'm meeting with my property managers regularly to make sure that the deals are still making me money, to make sure that these deals are still good. So yeah, there's still some level of work in it, but this is where the next thing you have to ask is, is passive income really what you want right now? And I remember having a conversation with a guy in the gym about this, where there was this young, I think he was like 24 years old, 22 years old, really young guy who told me that he wants to generate passive income. And I said, why? And he was like, I wanna be rich. And I said, okay. Why? Like, what are you really trying to get at? And he was talking about how he loved this idea of not having to work for money. And I said, okay, well, let's let's talk about this. If you can generate, say, a 10% cash on cash yield on your money, a 10% return on your money, which is a really good return, especially in this economy. It's a really good cash flow on your money, meaning for every $100 you invest, you get $10 of cash flow or passive income, whether it's from stocks or real estate or whatever it might be. If you can generate a 10% return on your money, how much money would you need to be rich? And he probably said, I think like a couple hundred thousand dollars or something. And I said, okay, well, that means you would need $2 million invested into assets today. That way you can generate your $200,000 worth of cash flow. Is that really what you want to do right now? Do you have $2 million? And this is where now the question is, what are you really working for? I get it. People want financial freedom. Financial freedom comes from owning assets that pay you. But what is it do you really want? Because if you're an entrepreneur, if you have that hustler or I want to build a business mindset, your goal isn't passive income. Your goal is building a business. And then if you can build a business, you can build your income, then you can take the income or the sale of your business. You can take this money that you've earned, that you've built, that you've created, and then you can use this money to go out and buy the passive income. That's what's going to buy you the freedom. So that's where now you have to ask the question of what is it that you're truly working for? Do you want the passive income where you're just looking to create a new stream of income? That way you have this cash flow, so you have that financial freedom? Or are you looking to build that real richness right now where you're looking to build your income, you're looking to build your business, you're looking to build the valuation of what you have, that way you can sell it or that way you own this big cash flow producing business, which isn't passive, until you either sell it or until you hire a new CEO, but you're working to build this product. And then one day when you're ready, you can take this value, this business, and then you can go out and buy these 10% cash flow producing assets. And again, many times assets are not going to pay 10%, but just for a hypothetical. And so that's where now you have to start asking yourself and understand what's going on. There's nothing wrong with investing for cash flow. I love investing for cash flow, but my number one investment is into my own business. And the reason why is because when I invest my money into my own business, there's no limit to the types of returns that I can see, right? When I go out and invest in real estate, which is my favorite way to generate cash flow, I also generate cash flow from dividend paying stocks. But if I'm investing my money into real estate to generate cash flow, my goal is to get a 7% cash on cash return, a 7% cash flow on my money. When I invest my money in the stock market, I'm getting dividends. Maybe it's three or four percent. When I put my money into a high interest savings account, maybe it's four to five percent. So we're talking three to seven percent are the types of cash flow returns that I'm getting when I put my money into these passive assets. When I put my money into my own business, my goal isn't to get a three to seven percent return on my money. My goal is to get a 10, 20, 30, 200 percent return on my money because now when I put money into my business to hire more people, to invest in more softwares, to invest in more marketing. Now my goal is to accelerate the growth of the business. We're trying to take more market share. We're trying to increase the amount of products that we can sell. We're trying to increase the size of our business. It's a completely different game. It's not passive. I work every single day in the business. It's not passive at all, but it creates the opportunity for more income, which can then buy me more passive income. And I don't like using the terms passive income because there's always some sort of work required. I like the terms cash flow, but I'm just sticking with passive income because everybody in the internet is looking for this type of passive income. And this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is what do you really want? If you just want the financial freedom and you want that type of passive income, great, because you don't like your job, fine. Every time you get paid, put some money into these types of assets, the passive assets, whether it's rental properties, whether it's crowdfunded real estate deals, whether it's dividend paying stocks, 
whatever it might be, that way now you can start generating this cash flow and you can do this. And every time you get paid with your cash flow, you buy more of these assets. You get paid with the dividends, you buy more dividend paying ETFs and you just keep playing this game where you just keep working to buy more of these assets. Maybe you do it for a decade, maybe you do it for two decades and you stick with it, you stay aggressive with it, you're working to spend less so you have more money to invest, you're working to earn more so you have more money to invest. Pretty soon, you're going to have a strong cash flow producing portfolio where you have enough income to fund your lifestyle and now you can not have to worry about your job as much because now you have that cash and freedom. But if you are more the entrepreneurial type and you want to build that income, it's a completely different game. Now you're not playing for this passive income yet per se, you're working to build the income and then you can use the income to then fund the passive income as you grow that income and you got to find that right balance for you. I don't invest in real estate the way that I used to because I have a better investment opportunity in my business. Now, if I see a good rental property, sure, maybe I'll invest in it, but my number one priority right now is investing into my own business because that's where I see the most opportunity for me. Now, of course, this is where, again, it pays to stay up to date on what's happening because it will allow you to make the smartest decisions with your money. The best way for you to stay up to date on what's happening is to actually read the raw data, read the press releases. That way, you don't get bogged down with all the emotions. If you don't have the time or the interest to do that, the second best thing to do is to join something like Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter, which I created to help regular investors, number one, stay up to date on what's happening. Number two, avoid all the sensationalism. And number three, save time because you read our newsletters in less than five minutes every morning. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, it's completely free and it's an easy way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in the financial markets. And I'll put the link to how you can join down in the description below. And you can also go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. I think a big reason why people are really searching for new ways to generate quote unquote passive income is because the cost of living has grown so significantly relative to wages. Take a look at these numbers. Between 1970 and now, wages have increased by around 640%. Over the same time, housing costs have gone up by around 1100% car prices have gone up around 1,500%, and public university prices have gone up by around 1,900%. When you see these numbers, naturally, you can understand why people need more money to survive. You hear stories of your parents and your grandparents talking about, how, oh, back in my time, I used to work a job my wife didn't have to work and I had enough money to fund my lifestyle. Well, today that system doesn't work. Now you have two income households and people are still struggling to survive because households incomes have risen, but they haven't risen fast enough to keep up with the cost of living. And notice that when I showed you these numbers on the screen, I said household incomes, not your average wages. Household incomes are looking at both parties who are potentially earning an income. And back in the 1970s, it was one income generating the household income. Today, it's two incomes generating the household income and people are still struggling to survive. And this is where it has become so crucial to understand how you can earn more money because the reality is if you want to continue living a decent lifestyle today, it has become so important to learn how to earn more money. And this is where you know the argument everyone's making is, oh, my boss needs to pay me more. Well, if they're not, you can ask for more money, but if they don't give it, you also need to find an alternative. Complaining, crying, kicking, screaming is not going to fix it. And this is where you have to understand the reality of what's going on in the economy. Now, I've talked about what has caused this. The cause of this is the inflation. Because in the early 1970s, we had our dollar stripped from the gold standard, meaning the dollar was no longer tied to gold. The government could spend whatever amounts of money it wanted. The Federal Reserve Bank, which is a central bank here in the United States, could print an unlimited amount of money, which meant that the value of our dollar started to drop, causing the price of things to go up. When we started to see that happen, well, naturally the prices of things rose, and that's what then caused the inflation that we've been seeing over the last number of decades, and especially the last few years. All the money printing has devalued our currency, causing the price of things to go up, making it more difficult for people to survive off of one income and now even two incomes, which means if we fast forward now 10, 20, 30 years, what is it going to be? Is it going to be enough for people to survive off of one income like it was in the 1970s? Is it going to be the same like it is today where people need two incomes to survive? Or will it be four income households? as in two people need two jobs each in order to survive. Now, you can guess and pick whichever it might be, but this is what I'm trying to get you to understand is 
Well, instead of trying to hope that things are going to go back to how it was in the 1970s, understand the trend. Inflation has made the cost of living rise faster than wages. Period. The cause of this is all the money printing because of the Federal Reserve Bank and the spending by the government. Unless the government stops spending so much money, which doesn't look like it's going to happen, and unless the Federal Reserve Bank says we're not going to keep printing any more money, which doesn't look like it's going to happen, we're going to continue seeing what we've been seeing over the last 50 years. So now as you project out for the later parts of your career, what's going to happen? Well, if the cost of living keeps rising, you are going to need more income which means you want to start preparing for this today. And I know this is not something that most people want to hear, but I'd rather you learn this sooner rather than later. That way you can prepare and take better care of your family. Right? My goal here isn't to make friends. My goal here is to help you be better with your money. That way you can make more wealth for yourself, your family, and your community. And this is where understanding this inflation problem is not going away. Even if inflation goes back down to 2%, it's still there. And that means the cost of living is going to keep rising and, well, if your wages are not keeping up, you're going to see the value of your earnings, the buying power of earnings continue to drop, and the buying power of your savings continue to drop while the prices of things keep rising. So now, how do you earn more money? Well, there's a lot of ways you can do this. And thankfully, today, there are more opportunities than ever before. And this requires, number one, your interest, and number two, your work ethic, because it is going to require more time on your part. Now, if you want to do it from a job, you can try to find ways to earn more money from your job. Maybe you work for a raise, you work for a promotion, maybe you work to get some more hours, maybe you work to do more at your job, that way you can earn more money. Maybe you work to get a second job, that way now you can really work to earn more money today. And you don't have to do this permanently for the rest of your life because I call it the decade of sacrifice. The way that you build wealth is by owning assets, period. It's not by saving a lot of money because your savings are losing value to inflation and as soon as you start spending your savings, the savings amount decreases. It's not through your salary because if you break your leg and you can't go to work, well, you no longer get a salary. The way that you build wealth is by owning investments because these investments can continue to pay you even when you're not working. And as you see more inflation, that generally benefits investments. Now, if you see a recession, of course, investment values can go down, but that also creates good buying opportunities to own and buy more investments. So now, how do you get more investments? Well, you got to spend less or you got to earn more or both that we have more money to own these investments. And right now, if you're seeing what's going on with the cost of living, well, people need more money to survive. Now, how do you build your own wealth? Because you can't just spend all of your money and not put money away to build your wealth, even if the cost of things are rising, right? People are looking at what's happening right now. They're saying, oh my God, if student loans have to start again and I have to pay more money to my student loans, I'm not gonna be able to invest my money anymore. You cannot make that sacrifice. You still have to continue building your wealth no matter what's happening in the outside world, which means you're gonna have to figure out either A, how do you spend less money, or B, how do you earn more money, or C, how do you spend less and earn more money that we have our money to invest, period. If you want to build wealth, you will have to do that because nobody else is going to do it for you. I hate to break it to you, but Social Security is not going to be enough for you to retire. And your 401k is not enough for you to retire. Even the founder of the 401k has come up publicly and said that the 401k has gone awry because so many people are relying solely on the 401k to retire. And it was never intended to be your sole retirement plan, which means you're going to have to invest more money, period. That is your way out. You got to spend less. You got to stop playing the spending game of financing the brand new car. You got to stop playing the spending game of constantly having the new Gucci. You got to stop playing the spending game of having the nice stuff right now. So you have more money to invest and also work to earn more money. That way you can go out and invest more aggressively. So now how do you earn more money? Back to the original question, because if things continue to go down the path that we've been seeing happen the last number of decades, how can you access more money? We talked about how to do it from a job. If it's not from a job, look for ways to earn money outside of a job. And the internet has made this so much more accessible, not easier, but accessible than ever before. Because now on the internet, the name of the game is attention. 
If you can grasp somebody's attention on the internet, maybe it's with a blog that you write, maybe it's with a newsletter that you create, maybe it's with your Instagram page, maybe it's with a TikTok page, maybe it's with a podcast that you start, maybe it's with a YouTube channel, maybe it's with something else. If you can grasp somebody's attention on the internet, you can then make money on the internet. Attention is the new currency on the internet, and the way you get paid now is by monetizing the attention. Now, the simplest way to monetize the attention is with advertisements, right? If you have videos on YouTube, you have a podcast out there, you're going to be able to have advertisements on your content and you can generate money. If it's not through advertisements, you can also sell somebody else's products. So you don't have to build your own business. This is called affiliates where other businesses will pay you for promoting their stuff, or you can build your own product. You can sell your own service. Maybe you have a service. You have a bookkeeping service that you can offer. You have an accounting service. You can do uh, digital marketing for somebody. You can do graphic design for somebody. You can do writing for somebody. You can do the legal work for somebody. You can do some sort of health consulting for somebody. If you have a service, you can offer that now to people who are watching, listening to, or reading your stuff. Because when you have somebody's attention, you can offer your product. You see me doing this all the time. I have a company called Briefs Media. One of the products that we have in Briefs Media is Market Briefs. Market Briefs is my free financial newsletter, where it's a way for me to keep regular investors up to date on what's happening in the financial news. It goes out six days a week. We have a team that's breaking down what's happening, things in the housing market, the stock market, the crypto market, the global economy, and our own economy into this fun, witty, and easy-to-read email, and it's completely free to you. And the way that we monetize market briefs is we sell advertisements in market briefs. This allows us to keep the newsletter free, but I have this attention on the internet. People watch my videos, and then I'm able to market and get promotion and exposure for market briefs. Now, if you want to join Market Briefs, you can go to briefs.co slash market briefs. That's briefs.co slash market briefs. And I also got the link for you down in the description below. But this is where now the question is, once you grasp somebody's attention, how do you monetize? And that's the easy part. You do not have to know how you're going to monetize when you start, but you have to get started because the reality is things are not going to go back to how they were in the early 1970s. Things are going to continue going down this direction. Things are going to continue getting more expensive. Sure, we might see periods of deflation. That's what happens sometimes when you see recessions. But then after that recession is over, the deflationary period ends and you see inflation kick back up. So you have to understand that if we continue to see the housing costs rise, if we continue to see the price of cars rise, if we continue to see the price of phones rise, if we continue to see the price of groceries rise, what are you going to do? How are you going to earn more money? And it's better for you to ask yourself this question sooner rather than later because it gives you more time to work towards it. It gives you more time to ask that question of what are you going to do and think about it. And this is why I keep saying that the best investment that you can make right now is by canceling your Netflix subscription. Not so you can save $15 a month, but you, so you can save two to three hours of your time every single day. That way you can reallocate this time to number one, learning about how you can earn more money. There's tons of videos on YouTube. There's tons of blogs on the internet. There's tons of people on the internet teaching this for free. And then you spend your time doing try things. That is the best education. Then of course, once you start doing things, invest in your own education, buy classes, buy coaching, buy that stuff because it will teach you lessons. Just don't get into all the gimmicky, hypey stuff. Learn lessons from people that are actually doing what they teach, but invest in yourself. And number one, it starts by learning. Then you got to do, then you got to fail. Then you got to keep learning and doing more. That's how you will learn but you have to get started. Listen, I had no idea that I was going to have a YouTube channel that has over a million subscribers on it. That was never my intention or my thought when I first got started, but I stayed consistent with my content year after year after year. I've been on YouTube for a long time. Look at my early videos. My videos sucked, but I learned and I improved. And that's what allowed me to build this platform, this minority mindset platform, which then became a funnel for businesses like Briefs Media. So this is where now, if you want to be able to earn more money, you can't just copy what anybody else does because it's too late for that, but you can learn and apply because the reality is you're going to need more money to number one, fund your lifestyle, and then number two, to continue to be able to invest and build your wealth because the last thing that you want to see happen is then you start sacrificing your opportunity to become wealthy because you just want to keep funding your lifestyle. Do not let that happen. We're seeing that happen everywhere. 
Use this as an opportunity to start learning, to start earning. That way you can continue building your wealth because that wealth is what's going to give you the opportunity to fund your family the way that you want. It's going to give you the ability to help your community the way that you want. And it's going to give you that financial freedom to fund your lifestyle the way that you want. And we are now officially starting to see the importance of this because of what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing now. The Federal Reserve Bank is officially starting to pivot. Jerome Powell has just taken his foot off of the interest rate accelerator with the first interest rate pause in 15 months. And this comes at a time where inflation is still running hot. Now, the interesting thing about the Federal Reserve Bank's latest move was that Jerome Powell still said that you need to be prepared for more rate hikes in the future. Now, you naturally are probably wondering, well, why are you telling us to be prepared for the future instead of just giving us the rate hikes right now? Well, this is what Jerome Powell had to say. He said, holding the target range, meaning the federal funds rate steady at this meeting allows the committee to assess additional information and its implications for monetary policy. In other words, he says that he wants more time to take a look at where inflation is going and based off of where he thinks inflation is going in the next meetings, they then will make the decision of how much more they want to continue raising interest rates. Now, the thing that I want you to understand here in inflation is that there are two main numbers in inflation that people like to pay attention to. Number one is CPI, and number two is core inflation. CPI is the headline inflation number that the media loves talking about. This is that inflation number that everyone keeps saying when you hear that inflation has fallen so significantly. The second is core inflation. Core inflation is the CPI numbers, and then you strip out what's called, quote unquote, the volatile numbers, which are things like energy and food. This core inflation is what the Federal Reserve Bank prefers to look at to measure inflation. This is what they've been saying for years, that they prefer measuring inflation with core inflation because it gives them a better gauge on what inflation is. Now, let's take a look at inflation versus core inflation numbers over the last few years. This data and this chart is from the Federal Reserve Bank. And the red number, this red line is core inflation and the blue line is CPI. And what you see is that we saw this peak in CPI back in June of 2022, when we saw CPI hitting right around 9%. And then ever since that peak, we've been seeing CPI fall rather drastically. Now, if you look at core inflation, core inflation has been kind of not really dropping that much. Core inflation peaked at right around 6.5%. But then after that 6.5% peak or 6.6% peak, core inflation has fallen to the low 5% inflations. So yes, inflation has fallen. CPI has fallen pretty drastically. It's still very far away from its 2% goal. But core inflation, which is the core measure that the Federal Reserve Bank likes to look at to measure inflation, is still significantly high. And it hasn't really fallen that much off its peaks. We went from the mid sixes to the low five percents, which means we still have a long way to go to really bring it down to two percent. And this is where the Federal Reserve Bank is looking at all the data. They're seeing the same inflation data that you and I are looking at. And then they're also looking at the economic data and they're seeing that the economy is slowing. The economy is slowing faster than expected. And they're saying maybe these interest rate hikes that we've been doing are starting to really hurt the economy. And hopefully the interest rate hikes are going to have more of a delayed effect on inflation because what they don't want to do is they don't want to break the economy in order to fix inflation. What they hope will happen is that they will be able to raise interest rates to a certain level, which now they're saying is going to be around the mid 5%. They're going to be able to raise interest rates to a certain level and this higher interest rates will bring inflation down and it's going to bring the economy down slowly but not cause any significant recession or any real recession at all. This is what the Federal Reserve Bank is hoping for. But the risk that they're taking is if we don't stay aggressive on inflation, well, a couple things can happen. You know, you heard the saying that when you try to make everybody happy, you end up making nobody happy. And right now what they're trying to do is they're trying to make inflation happy and they're trying to keep the economy happy because they want to slowly bring inflation down without overly hurting the economy. Well, the risk with that is, well, you can make nobody happy because now if inflation doesn't start falling quickly and the economy continues to slow, well, then that could force the Federal Reserve Bank to then have to take even more aggressive action on inflation, which would then hurt the economy even more. And this is where now the question is, 
what will the Federal Reserve Bank do and what are they going to prioritize more, inflation or the economy? And this is the big question. This was the question that we posed back in 2020. We talked about it in 2021. We talked about it in 2022. And now we're really starting to see the implications of this in 2023. What is the Fed going to prioritize, inflation or the economy? Because if we see the economy start to hurt, how do you stimulate the economy? Well, you can cut interest rates and you can print money. Well, yeah, that can pump more money into the economy. That can get more people buying things, which can help boost the economy. But that's going to hurt inflation, right? If the Fed started to cut interest rates, if mortgage rates went down to 4% tomorrow, you're going to see a boom in the housing market. Home prices are going to go up, which would cause inflation to then go up again. So yeah, if we start to see more pain in the economy, but inflation is not fixed and the Fed starts cutting interest rates, that's going to make the inflation problem first and put a band-aid on the economy. If the alternative happens where the Fed says, okay, the economy is hurting, but we're going to stay focused on inflation, that means that the Fed would then continue raising interest rates even though you're seeing pain in the economy, and that's going to hurt the economy even more because higher interest rates mean, well, your mortgage rates are even more expensive. Less people are going to buy homes. Less people are going to buy cars. Less people are going to be shopping, which means the economy is going to hurt even more at the expense of trying to bring inflation down. And the reason why this is so significant is because, well, we know how to fix an economic recession. We have seen a recession pretty much every decade for the last century. Recessions are a part of our economy. When you see a recession, we can stimulate, we can cut interest rates, we can do quantitative easing. We have done that many, many, many times. And we've seen that boost the economy. And now we're facing the price, the consequence of that, which is inflation. Now, unlike previous recessions, we're going into an economic slowdown with high inflation already being an issue. Right When the 2008 crash happened, when the 2020 pandemic happened, when the 2000.com bubble burst we didn't have an inflation issue going into the recession. We just had the economic issue, which then the Federal Reserve Bank fueled, fixed with more inflation. Now, we didn't have an inflation issue after any one of these recessions until now. After the 2020 pandemic, we are now facing the inflationary issue. So now, if we go into more economic pain with inflation already there, how do you fix it? And this is where now, again, it goes back to what is the Fed going to prioritize? And this is that tough question where what are they going to pick, inflation or the economy? Now, again, we know how to fix the economic issues, but the inflationary issues are less certain. And the inflationary issues are also a lot more painful because if you face high inflation for a long time, well, that hurts everybody, right? Inflation makes consumption more expensive. And the majority of America are only consumers, the majority of America are not investors or business owners. Meaning, when you have inflation, the cost of buying things goes up and people's ability to buy things goes down. So high inflation hurts the average person's ability to spend, it hurts the average person's ability to live life, and it hurts the average person's ability to build wealth because now you got to pay more money for your rent and your groceries so you have less money to invest. That's what inflation does. And so when you have high inflation for a long time, not only do you hurt the average person's ability to build wealth and spend, but you're also hurting the valuation and the currency value. And that can pose even more issues. And so currency issues, high inflationary issues, can become significantly painful, much more painful than a recession. And this is where it goes back to the question, what is the Federal Reserve Bank going to prioritize? Is it going to be inflation or is it going to be a recession? Recessions are sometimes necessary to reset the economy. Nobody wants to admit this, but the reality is recessions are sometimes necessary to cool down an overheated economy. And we're living in a society right now where people want to avoid any type of pain, right? We want to desensitize ourselves from any sort of pain, but the reality is sometimes you need economic pain to reset and cool off and get the dumb investments and the dumb businesses out. Yes, that comes at a price because when dumb businesses fail, the employees who worked at this company that was run by somebody bad will unfortunately lose their jobs. That's not fun. That's painful. But... You can't let anything go up forever. We've done multiple deep dives on this in Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter, which is why if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I highly recommend you do so because it's an easy and free way for you to stay up to date on what's happening in things like the economy, the housing market, the stock market, crypto, and the global economy. 
It's a fun, witty, and easy to read email. We can read it in less than five minutes every morning and it's completely free. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, you can go to briefs.co slash market. That's briefs.co slash market. And I also got the link for you down in the description below. But this is where now you have to kind of look at all the factors. The Federal Reserve Bank has already started pivoting. They just did their first rate pause because they don't want to break the economy and they want to hope and see where inflation is going. They said, Jerome Powell said openly that you need to expect more interest rate hikes in the future. But why not do it now? If the interest rate hikes are important to bring inflation down, why not do that now? You know you're going to do it in the future. You said you want to do it in the future. Why not do it now? It is to see what direction inflation is going. And the goal for the Federal Reserve Bank is not to keep hiking interest rates because that's going to keep hurting the economy. But they don't want to hurt the economy while they bring inflation down if they don't have to. And this is where, again, you have to pay close attention to what the Federal Reserve Bank is doing because these are going to be critical decisions because over the next 24 months, we're going to see a huge amount of debt readjust at the higher interest rates. And if interest rates continue to stay high or if they go higher, well, that means that corporations and commercial landlords and their government which is holding on to large pieces of adjustable rate debt. As that debt readjusts, your payments, your debt servicing costs are going to go up, not because the amount of debt that you have went up, but because the cost of owning that debt goes up. See, most corporate debt, most commercial landlord debt, and most of our national debt is not 30-year fixed rate mortgages. It's readjusting debt, and we're going to see a huge chunk of our debt here in the United States, readjust in the coming 24 months. This is why you, as a financially educated person, number one, need to understand this. And then number two, prepare and be financially educated. Prepare means, one, spend less, earn more. Don't use 2023 as a year to finance a brand new truck. Use this as a year to get financially smart. That way you can have extra cash put aside to protect you. And then also capitalize on opportunities that might come your way, but then also build your financial education. Learn about how do you capitalize on opportunities? How do you invest? Is it the stock market? Is it real estate? Is it building your own business? Is it buying other businesses? Learn about this. And everyone say, well, how do I learn? Start watching YouTube videos. Once you start watching YouTube videos, then start reading books. There are so many pieces of information out there. Yeah, you're not going to learn this in school, but there are so many different pieces of information out there that you just have to start learning and putting yourself out there. And then you got to start doing. You cannot bypass that experience. But this is where understanding what's happening. Interest rates are a lot higher than where they used to be. Inflation is still pretty high. Yeah, CPI is coming down, but it's still not at 2%. And core inflation is still really high. The economy is slowing down. The Fed says that they want to raise interest rates. Will they? Who knows? Even if they start cutting interest rates, well, then that's going to make the inflation problem worse. Who does inflation benefit? Well, it disproportionately benefits investors. This is what you got to pay attention to. If they stay aggressive on inflation, that's going to hurt the economy and that's going to create more opportunities to buy assets at a discounted price. So understand the different things that are happening right now. That way you can be prepared. You can be financially educated because it's your duty to take care of yourself, your family, and your community. And it all starts with building that education in your mind. If you are in your 30s right now and you want to retire a millionaire, there are two things you have to do. Number one is you have to figure out how far you are from becoming a millionaire. And number two, you have to put a plan in place to actually become a millionaire. Notice how neither one of these two things require you to go out and get lucky or win the lottery. See what most people do when they decide that I want to go and become wealthy or I want to become